In this tutorial, we will cover how to manage atmospheric pressure, filtration, temperature control, and learn about gas behaviors. The most basic way of managing air pressure is to use the starting O2 tank to fill your atmosphere. Be warned, as you won't have a way to fill your suit's O2 if you use up all the tank's oxygen. To see the pressure and temperature of your oxygen tank, you can hover over the gauge at the top and look at the text pop-up. To release its contents into the air, simply turn the valve on the back of the tank. Be sure to read the text indicating if you'll be increasing or decreasing the amount released. You will need a minimum of 6 kPa of pure O2 to survive, despite what the warnings on screen say. While unusual and unrealistic, you can survive in a pure O2 environment. You can see your current pressure on the bottom right of your screen. Another way of filling up your atmosphere early is to melt ice with your welder. Although, be warned, this will result in your base temperature lowering, and it will fill your base with toxic gas which you will need to filter out, which will be covered later. Luckily, if the temperature is above the melting point of the ice, or if the ice is in direct line of sight to the sun, it will melt by itself. This will release its gases into the atmosphere and cool it. Typically, at the start, you will have a portable scrubber and a portable AC unit, along with a tank of liquid nitrogen. For the portable scrubber, there are three slots for a battery and two filters. The scrubber, when turned on, will suck in the gases that match the filter in the back. If the gauge in front is full, the scrubber will stop working and require dumping its contents back into an atmosphere via the handle on the side. The portable AC unit has a battery slot and a liquid canister slot. When the top switch is blue, it will cool the room and heat the canister. When red, it will heat the room but cool the canister. It requires a canister if cooling, however it's optional when heating as it is able to consume extra power to heat with element. With all of the basics covered, let's move on with the advanced material. Given that each person's scenario is different, I will cover what each component does by itself. That way, you can create your own atmospheric control systems. Then, at the end of the video, I will show some examples. Here are the components I will be covering. Seated portables, AC units, filtration units, radiators, heat exchangers, wall heaters, wall coolers, valves, and phase change. First, it's important to visualize how pipe networks work. When you place a pipe, a network is created. No matter how long the pipe is, the contents will always be the same as any other directly attached pipes. However, once you introduce any component between pipes, it will separate that network into two. So even if you have an open valve between two pipes, this creates two distinct pipe networks. The portables you know and love can actually be seated with the portables connector. They maintain the exact same functionality except they use the attached pipe network. The AC unit will use the pipe network instead of the liquid canister, while the filtration unit will output any filtered gases into the pipe network it's attached to. The AC unit is very similar to the seated portable AC unit, except it gives you more control, featuring buttons to control the temperature and dedicated power outlets for your power network to attach to. There are three pipe connections. The input takes a gas that you desire to be cooled or heated. The output is where the gas goes after it's been heated or cooled. And finally, the waste port, which is where the AC unit gets the hot or cold. For example, if you wanted to heat gas, the waste side would get colder as the output gets hotter. The filtration unit has a dedicated power outlet and has three pipe connections. The input, which is the starting gas network you wish to filter from. The filtered, which will export any gases of the type filters you inserted. And unfiltered, which will eject the remainder of the gas. There are two kinds of radiators for both gas and liquid pipes, radiation and convection. Radiation will radiate heat into a vacuum which will cool down gases. Convection will balance the temperature of the pipe and the atmosphere it's in. The smallest radiator can be placed directly on a pipe which will directly affect the pipe network it is placed on, while the medium and large radiators will require connection via pipes. When connected, the input gas will flow into the radiator, get processed, then get outputted. In layman's terms, you can think of the radiator as a valve for heat. Heat exchangers are much like radiators except they trade temperature between pipe networks. These contain an input pipe and an output pipe, with the exception of the counterflow heat exchanger which has two sets of inputs and outputs. The speed of its heat exchanging is based on the flow of the pipe networks. Both networks need to be flowing in opposite directions for it to work. The wall heater is a plug and play system. Wire it up and turn it on and use element to heat the atmosphere it's in. The wall cooler will attempt to use the attached pipe network to cool the base down. To understand anything from here on out, you need to know how gases work. Let's pull up a graph using the F1 key in-game and searching for water. Looking at this graph, we can see three distinct phases. If we have 20 degrees Celsius water, anything above 11.9 kPa will turn into liquid. Anything below 11.9 kPa will turn into steam. At this temperature, there is no pressure that will make the water become a solid. We will need 0 degrees Celsius at any pressure above 6.3 kPa. But notice how we can have cold steam as long as our pressure is below that. To undergo a change in phase, it will need to absorb heat from somewhere or release heat to somewhere. When going from a solid to liquid to gas, heat is required and so it cools the surrounding area. The inverse is also true. This is the principle behind the phase change devices. 
There are two phase change devices, the evaporation chamber and the condensation chamber. The evaporation chamber will attempt to change a liquid into a gas, and so as a liquid input, a gas output, as well as a gas connection, which is where the input of liquid will attempt to absorb heat from and thus cool it. The condensation chamber has the same amount of inputs except you input a gas and get a liquid, meaning that it is the polar opposite of the evaporation chamber. Both of these devices have a valve to change the pressure setting. Using the phase change graph will allow you to determine if the liquid will turn into gas. For example, at 20 degrees Celsius water will turn into a gas when below 11.9 kPa. To better understand this, let's use the evaporation chamber as an example. Imagine we're using water to cool an oxygen pipe. For water to absorb heat and cool the oxygen, it must evaporate, which requires it to be in liquid form. However, as shown in the phase graph, once water reaches 366 degrees Celsius, it can no longer exist at a liquid at any pressure. For the condensation chamber, the opposite is true. We do not want the water to reach 0 degrees Celsius, as it would freeze the water and burst our pipes. It's important to remember that this process doesn't create hot or cold. It simply redistributes existing thermal energy, separating into hot and cold parts. When these are recombined, the overall temperature returns to what it was originally. The various special valves allow you to eject liquids from a gas pipe into a liquid pipe or vice versa, meaning you can do exactly what the phase change device does with valves, pipes, and pressure regulators. For example, you can create both an evaporation chamber and a condensation chamber by using a pressurant valve and an expansion valve. The pressurant valve moves gas to a liquid pipe to increase pressure, which forces the gas to condensate, while the expansion valve moves liquid into gas pipes, which causes evaporation, which cools the system. Now we can move on to some examples. The first would be basic vacuum cooling, which can be done on the moon, Mimis, or asteroid belt. It is simply a passive vent going to a valve attached to a radiator. The passive vent takes air from the base, which is then cooled by the radiator. However, it can be shut off with the valve if need be. Although, depending on the pressure, this runs the risk of freezing the pipe above the valve. It's an amazing early game solution for cooling. On most maps, except Europa, you won't need heating due to the greenhouse effect. However, in a pinch, an early game solution is to redirect the excess heat from your furnace to a radiator within your base. Oxide and volatiles are much more common than you realize, and using to heat your base in an emergency is a good strategy, especially as it takes no power to do so, which is a big problem to overcome on cold planets. Here's an example that works even on Venus. Typically, an AC unit can only create so much difference between the two sides. You'll notice the outside is 463 degrees Celsius, but this AC unit effectively stops cooling at 384 C. The solution? Simply add more. If the first AC unit stops at 384 degrees Celsius because 463 degrees Celsius is too hot, then use the 384 degrees Celsius to cool down another pipe and repeat. You'll go from 384 294, 190, 48, and finally 20 degrees Celsius. And the last one is if I want to get even colder. For advanced heating, you can actually copy the principle of series AC units, although beware that if you're in Europa, the temperature is negative 149 degrees Celsius, so do not pressurize the outside pipes above 1 MPA, otherwise you'll get liquids in your pipes, and while they can handle a few liters, it has a potential to burst them. While there are infinite ways to handle atmospheric control, I couldn't cover them all in a timely manner. The previous example should be more than enough to survive on, but feel free to challenge yourself into making a phase change atmospheric system. Thank you everyone for your support on the previous videos, and I hope this one is equally useful to you.